In 2020, TikTok was on the verge of being banned in the US, but today it's one of the fastest growing platforms on the internet. Everyone from celebrities like Will Smith to politicians like Georgia Senator John Ossoff are posting on the app. But how is TikTok changing our relationship with media? This is Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. This hour, TikTok's influence on American culture. We'll speak with a professor about the platform's impact on childhood development. And later in the show, a conversation about how TikTok is upending the music industry. But first, Gohar Khan is a TikTok creator from Seymour, Connecticut, and he has more than 1 million followers. His account is Gohar's Guide, and it covers college applications, test prep, and essay tips. One of his most popular videos reveals the best way to get on your teacher's good side. Now you're not gonna be a teacher's pet because nobody likes a teacher's pet, not even teachers. All you have to do is show that you care a little bit more about the class than everyone else. Gohar Khan is also the CEO and co-founder of Next Admit. It's a college counseling service. Gohar, welcome to Disrupted. Thank you so much, it's great to be here. You know, so many people to get through this pandemic, to have some fun, to connect with other people, created TikTok accounts. And over the past year, you not only created an account, but you have amassed over 1 million followers. Talk to our listeners about your journey to becoming a TikTok content creator. Of course. So the path to becoming a creator was really unexpected. I started by uploading TikToks in the middle of the pandemic. And when I first started uploading, there were just videos about me. There were just some lighthearted jokes, my family. And I uploaded one video that was about my college that ended at the college that I went to, which was MIT, which I just graduated from in June. And then that video started to gain some traction. You know, people started commenting, do you have any advice? What was the application process like? So I followed up with a little advice video and that gained even more traction. So it really just became a snowball effect, right? I just started to upload more and more college app advice videos. And, you know, what started off as just a personal account quickly became a college app advice account. By September, I was at around 30,000 followers. And then I changed up my whole content style. I kind of upped my audio quality, video quality. By the end of the year, I was at half a million followers. And now here I am, you know, at over a million followers. And it feels surreal because TikTok and, you know, my business now are just my full-time jobs. And I couldn't be more grateful, honestly. So I'll tell you, Gohar, I have, I think, four followers on TikTok. So it clearly pales in comparison. But I always wonder for people like you who have found this area in TikTok to do something different, but to also do something that is making the way better for other people. What's that feeling of realizing what started out as fun, I now have been able to monetize, but I also am helping other students think about success in their journeys? It's a surreal feeling. And I think what really gets me, so two things. One, you know, I've been through half of one admission season, you know, the admission season of 2020. And this past February, a bunch of the comments that I was getting on my TikTok account were, Gohar, thank you so much. You know, your advice helped me through the application process. You know, I got into XYZ college because of you. And what's even more surprising is, right, right. I initially assumed that my videos were being consumed by students and only students. But then I quickly realized, you know, based on a few messages that there were counselors and teachers that were also sharing my videos with their students. And to almost have that validation that, you know, my advice was not only valid and helpful for these students, but for teachers and, you know, other people in the education system, it was surreal. And I think that's when I realized, you know, what I was doing was valid. It was having an impact. And to this day, I'm really grateful that people do find value in what I post online. Well, I will tell you that as a college professor who often has young people and their families coming to me saying, how do we demystify this process? How do we figure out what our young people should be doing? Your videos are helpful because of the content, but also the format that you deliver this info. So it doesn't feel overwhelming. It doesn't feel threatening. It feels like something that everyone can access and really make use of the practical tent. 
how did you decide on your approach to the content? Because you said it changed from when you first started making these videos to what you have now. How did you make that choice? Yeah, so between June and September, all of my videos were just face videos. I was talking directly to the camera and I was just saying, you know, straightforwardly, these are my tips. This is what you should do. But then in September, I sat down one evening and I realized that I needed to up my style because there were many people in the space. You know, there were other college app content creators and I had a bit of editing experience. I had this like fancy mic set up and I was like, you know what? I need to leverage what I have around me and make the best college app TikTok account or t- TikTok content possible. So that's when I had the idea to actually use a real camera to record some of my videos, use this microphone setup. And it really started naturally. I think my first video was just with the camera of my desk. And then the next video was like more of like a bird's eye view tabletop shot. I noticed that that tabletop setup was really efficient. It allowed me to kind of incorporate a bunch of objects, colorful cutouts into my videos. And so then that tabletop setup is what I used for all of my ensuing videos and the kind of pattern that I follow to today. What is it about TikTok? Because as you said, there are many avenues that people could deliver this kind of info and content. But what is it about TikTok from a content perspective and a creator's perspective that really draws you to say, this is the platform where I want to focus the kind of work that you're doing? So I believe that TikTok is almost a meritocracy. I believe that, you know, you can have zero followers, but if you post an engaging piece of content, if you can, in essence, prove to the algorithm that there will be people who will watch your content from start to finish, it will push it out to the masses. And I think that aspect is beautiful because, you know, with other platforms where you have to be like, oh, follow my Instagram account, follow my YouTube account, right? You know, and then, you know, the algorithm will start to pick up on what you post. With TikTok, it's really just about the content. It's really about producing content that people will watch, people will enjoy, people with, people will resonate with. And I think it alleviates some of the stress there because I don't have to worry about pumping my account. It's just, I need to focus on creating the best and most engaging content possible every single day. And I think just having that direct focus helps me really hone my craft. And I really do appreciate that. You know, some people have been critical of TikTok to say that while it does provide an opportunity for those who are creative or who work on particular parts of their craft to showcase that, some people argue that it uh, diminishes particular types of creators. And so we've been hearing a lot about who gets the credit for content and who gets to be showcased in that way so that it can be a lucrative enterprise. What do you say to those critics, not just from your experience, but what you know about the platform more broadly? So I do 100% believe, you know, their point is valid. And when it comes to TikTok, you you know, it does stifle some people's creativity because you have to be very particular about how you create your content, what you say, when you say it. And it's all about watch time, right? TikTok is really just a competition about capturing people's, you know, short attention or consideration spans. So you don't really have too much freedom over, you know, maybe expressing yourself, whether it's like through art or music. It's like you need to hook the viewer in within the first two seconds. And At times, it may feel a bit superficial because it's like, you know, you have to really produce and think about every second of the content. Whereas on YouTube with long form content, you know, it feels more natural. You can make a 10 minute video. You can talk about what you want to say. But with TikTok, it really is an art and it really is a craft. You kind of have to perfect, you know, over the course of weeks, if not months. And I remember a few weeks ago when Facebook and Instagram were down and a lot of people were really panicking. And there were some people who said, listen, it's just a platform to post pictures. Why is this such a big deal? And a lot of businesses said, no, we are losing money because we can't talk about our product or services or content creators saying we're losing our opportunity to connect. And so sometimes there's a concern that TikTok may be fleeting. So Just for our listeners to know, this is not an overnight enterprise, but people wonder about what comes after that. And you were very savvy in using what you have been able to amass on TikTok to create this business called Next Admit. 
What is the mission of Next Admit? And then the other question, Gohar, is how do you balance your role as a TikTok creator with being a CEO of this new company? Of course. So the mission of Next Admit is to provide affordable college counseling services to high school students across the world. And, you know, when you look at the college admissions, college counseling industry, what you'll find are behemoths with prices, you know, ranging in the hundreds, if not thousands for essay editing services, consultation calls, mentorship. And we hope to provide an affordable alternative to students. And on top of that, this year, we started the Next Admit Fund that really is rooted in our mission of accessibility. So, you know, with, when it comes to low income, first generation students, we do our best to provide free services to them. And Next Admit has really been, it, it's an amazing business and I love running it, for, you know, in my day to day. But when it comes to balancing, you know, TikTok along with the business, it is difficult. And with most days, what I try to do is I'll wake up and I'll spend the first two, three, four hours of the day, however long I need to, on creating TikTok content. Like that is my first priority every single day. And once I get that done and once I'm happy with the content I've produced, I then move over to next admit. And that's when I switch into next admit mode, take care of emails, code, talk to consultants. But yeah, it's like I set aside time for uh, TikTok and the rest is just next admit. I just want to reiterate to our listeners, you are a Connecticut native, you're a recent graduate of MIT. You're fairly young and you have figured out what many people spend their whole lives struggling to understand is when you are passionate about something, it helps drive you to do it. And it becomes sustaining in a way that a mere paycheck cannot do. So I want to applaud you for that because you are not only creating increased access for students and their families, you're really challenging all of us to think about what are the spaces that we invest in. Is there pressure to continue creating new content? As you said, it could take four or five hours a day to think about that. Is there pressure to keep that going and and to keep extending your followers? Or do you use that pressure as motivation? That pressure is definitely motivation. And It exists. It's there all the time, especially with the slightly fickle nature of TikTok and the algorithm, because you'll see, you know, accounts with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers getting like one, two thousand views. And I think it just comes to show how TikTok and, you know, all these social media platforms nowadays are really just about the content and they're about watch time. I think followers, subscribers don't say much. And so that pressure is really just on the content. It's about creating engaging content every single day. And it's there, but it's definitely a motivating factor. So let me ask you a practical question, right? When you were thinking about, when you were in high school in Connecticut, thinking about where you wanted to go to school to pursue your formal education, maybe even your first couple of years at MIT, what was it that you thought you wanted to do professionally? And how do you think about that now, given the, the two, you're really doing two full-time jobs here. What was that process like? So growing up, I always imagined myself to become a software engineer. Like I've been coding since I was 11 and I love coding. I still do it every single day. But, you know, especially when I went to MIT, I was like, okay, you know, this is like me formally saying that I'm committing myself to a computer science degree to then graduate and become either a PM or a software engineer at some tech firm. And that was the only vision that I had. It wasn't really until the pandemic and my TikTok growth that I realized, you know, TikTok and Next Admit could be sustainable full time for me. And I'm super grateful that it worked out, but it's just really crazy to see how that shift in, you know, plans happened and how, and how it happened so quickly. What do you say to young people who may be listening to this conversation and thinking, I really admire and respect how he's been able to create and chart his own course, but maybe they're feeling some pressure from family or from peers to, you know, go in a direction that seems to be more secure and stable simply because people understand it. What's the advice that you give to young people? So when it comes to forging your own path, you know, at the basis, what you really have to do first is prove the concept. You have to prove that the path that you want to explore is viable and you have to prove it even in in the smallest way, really. It's not about, you know, generating thousands in sales and being like, oh, I have millions of followers. Look at me. You know, this is viable. 
I think one of the best ways to experiment and tell, you know, if the path you want to follow is viable in the case of social media is to create that TikTok account is to create those first few pieces of content. And I think with many young people and many aspiring content creators, the biggest hurdle is creating that first piece of content because they're held back by production quality, by lack of ideas, by fear of, you know, others' opinions. And so the core of it really is, you know, if there's a path that you think you want to follow, create, take the smallest step forward you possibly can, see how people react, see how it plays out, and then take it from there. But really taking that first step, no matter how small, as soon as possible is key. Gohar, you've been on TikTok for just over a year. What's next for you? I mean, five years from now, do you still see yourself as a creator on the platform? Or is this a stepping stone to something else? The TikTok account is definitely here to stay for the foreseeable future. But I definitely do see myself pursuing different startup ideas, different ventures over the next few years. And I think that's what I love most is just you know, pursuing the ideas, the visions, the concepts that come to mind that I'm passionate about. And that's what I hope to do for the foreseeable future. Gohar Khan is a Connecticut native, TikTok content creator, and CEO and co-founder of Next Admit. Gohar, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Thank you for having me. Coming up, we'll hear how TikTok is changing how kids find their identity and how the social media site is changing the music industry. This is Disrupted. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. This week, we've dedicated the show to the social media platform, TikTok. Later, we'll hear how TikTok is changing the music industry. But first, a 2019 report from the UK found that one in five teens spends more than five hours a day on social media. Sites like Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat have fundamentally changed how kids see themselves and the world around them. And TikTok may be even more powerful. Jamie Riccio is professor of communication and media studies at LaGuardia Community College, City University of New York. She researches how social media is altering the growth and identity development of adolescents. Jamie, welcome to Disrupted. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. You know, we're hearing a lot of conversation, a lot of controversy and angst about the role of social media with young people, in particular their development. But your work shows that there's always been this concern about media and young people and the influence of it. Let's talk broadly. Before the rise of social media, what was the role of media in childhood development? So media has always had an incredibly important role in the development of a young people's sense of self, right? So this is nothing new. And, and that is, as you mentioned, something that I, I am always trying to say, right? Uh, so going back to television, uh, particularly, right? We saw a lot of these concerns come up, especially, you know, television's raising the children. What kind of content are they being exposed to? Uh, how is this influencing their perceptions of the world around them, but uh, of course of themselves, right? Uh, and that's why we have conversations uh, when it comes to what we call, you know, these traditional, these legacy media, like television, like radio, uh, things like representation matter, right? Uh, young people seeing themselves on television, engaging with characters that they uh, that they relate to on television. These media forms, because they're so pervasive, because young people are being exposed to them at a young age, uh, and they're sponges. They take everything in, and they can learn about themselves, and they can either, uh, you know, decide that this is kind of the direction that they're going in, kind of develop a a more unified sense of self uh, based based on these performances that they might be seeing through media, or they can start to feel very disrupted, Uh, very fragmented and confused, right? And so um, 
it is a way that we, whether we're young or old, understand the world and understand ourselves through seeing ourselves presented uh, through media or, or through seeing like others presented through media. And, uh, and we take that in and we incorporate that into that exploration of who we will one day become. You know, I'm thinking from the perspective of of parents, of educators, and of quote unquote adults in the lives of young people. And there's always this concern about controlling the information that young people have access to or controlling their relationship to media. And what makes this current state somewhat different is, you know, it didn't take a lot to navigate radio and TV. We could all turn the dial on and felt like we understood what was happening. But with social media, with things like Facebook, and even I'm dating myself here, things like MySpace or Black Planet, a lot of adults said, wait a minute, I don't really know how this works. And that makes me even more uncomfortable when it comes to knowing what young people are doing. How has the rise of social media and these different platforms complicated what we know about identity development and what young people now have exposure for? Yeah, so, and there's this kind of this twofold uh, element to that question, right? So there is the element of control, right? So young people, especially, right, early adolescence, uh, even into late adolescence and childhood, particularly, that has always been an area of, of great concern for the, the adults in the room, so to speak, right? That this, these, these folks, these young folks need protection. They need uh, guidance. And not, I'm not saying that that is something that is not true, right? Uh, and that's where the role of, of education and digital literacy comes in. But uh, this idea of, yes, I could turn it on and off the TV. I can say, oh, you can't watch this channel or, oh, oh, sorry, we have some, you know, rated R movie on right now, guys, go away. You know, um, that is something that that adults have had more control over in the past because uh, they have been a little bit more familiar with that that technology. Again, it's been around for a long time. And so the, the internet age, uh, we have young people who are the what we call digital natives, right? Those who have been born into this world. This is something that they're the experts in, right? We're not. Uh, we're still figuring it out. Uh, social media to a lot of, of a lot of adults, a lot of older folks, a lot of parents, right, is still, as you mentioned, it's it's new. And that's scary to us. There's this misconception, right, that that children are innocent, that they're just innocent from day one. So there is, you know, there's that discomfort. And and uh, as the grown-ups, so to speak, we we need to become more comfortable with that. We need to maybe educate ourselves a little bit more. Let's talk about it being on us. Social media is so pervasive. It's all around us. It seems inescapable, literally from birth. What is the connection between social media and identity development that we need to focus on now that may be different from what we thought before, but is saying, what is the role and how do young people navigate through this? Absolutely. So one of the things that I will always mention is, again, just like any technology before it, it's there's it's twofold, right? There's there's two sides uh, to to TikTok to social media. So we absolutely have to be concerned about things like privacy violation, right? Uh, and and to talk to to kids about that, and to you know again see what's out there, make sure that there are protections on these uh, social media pages. But in talking to young people about this as well, what's really interesting is that. They, they know that, right? They know the risks that are inherent with their use of, of this, yes, very pervasive technology. Uh, and they, they say, of course, right? Of course, privacy is an issue, right? Oh my gosh, I know that my, my data is being collected. Come on, you don't know that that's happening, right? What's up, grandma? Right? And so that is something that, that, that they are very aware of. Uh, and they don't, they have a different definition of privacy than we do in a lot of cases. And so they control that. And this is not something that anyone told them to do, right? They just kind of knew that because I have grown up around Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, right now, TikTok, that this is something I think I should do for myself to, to guard what I think is, is private and to put out there what I, what I want to make public. When it comes to the, the real role of this incredibly pervasive media uh, in identity development, what I have found is that it is, I, I would say it's not 
drastically shifting or altering the way that young people uh, create their identities in the sense that they're, they're just coming up with, they're becoming these like totally different creatures that we won't recognize anymore, right? And, and we see this again in, in some of that, that fear that's being out, put out there, this, oh, you know, generation me, these narcissistic creatures who are our children. But instead, it's actually, it's modifying traditional conceptions of identity and identity development. So what I have found is because these platforms, they allow young people to do what they would do in everyday life anyway, right? So what they would do with their friends, with their communities, with their family members, uh, they are doing it all in this very condensed space. And that is not even my word. That is the word from, from young people who I have worked with who say, oh yeah, this is, this is who I am. It's just condensed. And so it is allowing for a lot more experimentation, uh, experimentation excuse me, sooner. Uh, so going on to Instagram, uh, curating very specifically the types of performances that you want to put out there to the public and deciding, okay, I'm going to be this person today and that person tomorrow, or I'm going to present this today and, and this later today, allows young people to uh, have this very condensed experience of uh, identity performance and feedback that then allows them to either uh, adopt various identities or shift and say, okay, that I got some negative feedback to that. That wasn't working out. So I'm going to, I'm going to go in this other direction. Things like gender identity, racial, ethnic identity, sexuality, sexual identity, you know, all of these aspects that oftentimes were thought of, oh, this is something that, you know, young people figure out. And probably by the time you're in your twenties, right. Um, we're seeing people figure it out much younger. You mentioned TikTok, which has become this explosive platform in just five years. And it's not just young people using platforms, you know, artists are using it and companies are using it and teachers are saying to students, create a TikTok as an assignment for a class. And yet what you mentioned is the algorithm and the curation of TikTok allows users, particularly young users, to then have this experience that is completely tailored on things that they may not realize. What is it about TikTok then in the kinds of things that you mentioned, the, the possibilities that you mentioned, what is it about that platform and that app that is so unique for young people figuring out their role in this world? Absolutely. So it's the affordances of TikTok, right? It's, it's the different characteristics that that platform has that really make it compelling uh, for young people. So in my research, what has been a, a constant finding is that highly visual social platforms are the most popular with young people, for instance, right? So TikTok is highly visual. Not only that, but it has these, these fun pieces of music. It's, it's, it's an auditory experience and you can, you know, just send a message just by the song that you choose or be part of a kind of a microculture just based on the song that you choose. It uses these, these visual auditory uh, affordances that allow this, this peak performance of self, right? Um, and so you are able to use these tools plus, again, things like hashtags. So these are, you know, old social media affordances, uh, but TikTok has been very successful in using hashtags to delineate uh, communities. You have, you know, hashtags for plant talk, for, for, for you know, uh, Furby talk, for instance, which I found myself on, right? There's these, these very specific, um, broad all the way to, to the most microcosm uh, uh, that can be delineated through hashtags. Uh, and then you can also tag people. So you can, you know, you can do duets, you can call out your friends or whoever might be engaging with this similar content. And so you can really tailor the message that you put out there. But then on, on you know, this kind of uh, this other side of, of TikTok, and you mentioned the algorithm for something like the For Your page, that is an, a, almost a wholly separate experience, right? So then based on what you're watching, what you're engaging with on TikTok, you're going to get these specifically curated videos to your exact tastes. It's the kind of stuff that we've been seeing with things like Spotify or Pandora, right? Or Netflix or, you know, these, these curated pieces of media content uh, that will help you again to maybe understand yourself uh, and the different domains of your identity more. Now, the issue can be, uh, so TikTok has been very secretive about their algorithm, about the four-year page algorithm. They've started to become a bit more transparent, but it is very, very, 
very detail oriented, right? It picks up on all these little elements, all these little pieces of data. Uh, and it's not just based on your likes, but it's based on, you know, the completion rate of the videos. Do you watch the video for the full length? Do you watch it multiple times? Who are you following, right? Um, what hashtags are you using? You can have a, an amazing experience that meets your exact needs of the identity that you are embracing that day. And that can shift based on the videos you're watching the next day, right? And, you know, certainly over time. Uh, and so you can find yourself a member of many different communities and learning about different aspects of your selfhood throughout. Now, where the problem is, is, of course, uh, if you like a video, if you just watch a video about, say, a conspiracy theory, then all of a sudden, the next day, you're going to see a couple more conspiracy videos uh, videos on your on your feed. Then maybe some more, and then you can find yourself down a you know QAnon uh, black hole on TikTok. And this has been something that that TikTok has come under fire for, uh, and that is especially problematic for young people, right, uh, who may not know how these algorithms work. So what do you say to the adults who are listening to this about digital literacy, but also supporting the opportunity for young people to explore, define, and refine their identity in whatever spaces they find? What's a good tip that you would give to the adults of how we also navigate this with our young people? The biggest tip I think I would give to to adults is to, again, in, engage with your your teen engage with the adolescents in your life on on their page and maybe on their for your page uh engage with the platforms uh engage with the young people in your life and uh and and find out what's going on there in their microcosm right and who they are exploring themselves to be uh on these platforms through these platforms and and then make decisions accordingly Jamie Riccio is Professor of Communication and Media Studies at LaGuardia Community College, City University of New York. Jamie, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank you, Kalila. It was a pleasure. Great being here. After the break, the covert ways the music industry relies on TikTok to make their next release go viral. This is Disrupted. Stay with us. And it went like... Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. TikTok has become a favorite tool to find new music. Lil Nas X's Old Town Road and Lizzo's Good As Hell first went viral on the platform before topping the record charts. And record labels are starting to take notice of the power of TikTok. Dan Waitley is a media reporter for Business Insider. He covers social media and the creator economy. Dan, welcome to Disrupted. Thanks for having me. You know, TikTok has only been around for about five years, but we've seen explosive growth during that time, going from being this very sort of niche video app to now generating over a billion users per month. Talk to our listeners about the origins of TikTok and how that app has gained in popularity. Yeah, so TikTok is owned by a company called ByteDance, which is based in China. And when ByteDance was looking to expand in the US, they acquired a company called Musical.ly, which was kind of like a dance and lip syncing app for teens and kids actually. And uh, so they acquired that company in late 2017 and essentially merged it into what is now TikTok in 2018. And so the, the app saw kind of a huge spike in users during the pandemic, which happened across the kind of social media ecosystem generally, as more people spent time inside, spent less time socializing in person. But uh, it was already kind of on the rise before that, kind of building off of some of the momentum it had from uh, the Musical.ly user base. So I want to talk about the role of music in that growth and that popularity. How does music play into the popularity of TikTok, but also the kind of rise and expansion that we've seen over the last two years in particular? Yeah, so music is really a core part of the TikTok user experience. On TikTok, they're called sounds, not songs. But the idea is that when you're uploading a video, you can use a sound that's popular on the app. You can add your own 
it's sort of this own feature uh, within TikTok and um, it's part of how people discover videos as well, because, you know, you can actually click on a sound and see all the different users that have used that sound, or maybe you are following a trend and that trend is actually built around this, a song. And so, uh, you know, part of why I think t- uh, music is core to TikTok is its roots, right? It was like a lip syncing song app in the beginning, but also I think it's just kind of the product design itself has made TikTok Uh, essential part of how people watch videos. You know, when I was growing up, videos were these sort of long form mini movies. It felt like that everyone wanted to see because that's when we could see who the artists were, you know, how they were connecting, what were the images. And TikTok is different in terms of the length of the video, how important it is to draw people in. But from a creative perspective, it also means that, you know, creators can spend a lot less money creating this, but also go viral and connect in different ways. How important is TikTok as an avenue for music, given the constraints of the app and the need to sort of grab people in a different way? Yeah, I think that that's a really important differentiation for TikTok when you compare it to something like YouTube. TikTok videos can take, you know, a few minutes to make and then the opportunity to be seen and discovered can be as good as if you're making a long YouTube video. And so the format is interesting for music in particular, because you're never, almost never going to be here, be hearing a full song. Usually you're going to be hearing like a snippet of a song, um, which is a big factor for artists when they're trying to kind of market their music on the app. They're thinking about what's the most catchy portion of a song that they're releasing, or, you know, maybe they're trying to kind of spark a trend around a portion of their song. Maybe there's a certain lyric that's going to resonate really well with the TikTok audience. Um, And so I do think that the fact that it's short-term video um, versus long form does really change how, um, you know, a performer or a record label is going to think about using the app. You know, we know that artists like Lil Nas X, who has generated a lot of buzz for a lot of different reasons. And I always say he is brilliant at marketing because he knows how to capture people, whether it's controversy or not, but bring them into his art in a way that perhaps wouldn't be allowed in other platforms. But also artists like Olivia Rodrigo, who have really become popular across sectors in the music industry via TikTok. But you mentioned marketing. And so it means then that music labels and companies are also realizing we can't just do business as usual. How then do record labels and musicians leverage TikTok as a way to get their music out there and in sort of crude terms, get their product out there? Yeah. So TikTok is an enormously important promotional tool for record labels, for music marketers, for artists. And there's a few different ways that they use the app to get uh, noticed. And and one of those is trying to create a trend. So, you know, if you have a new song you're releasing, maybe you pay TikTok influencers to do a dance that uses that song, or maybe you hire kind of comedic creators on the app to create a skit and, and that song's playing in the background. But the general idea is that you build a trend that's going to get more listens and and hopefully inspire people to go from TikTok to something like Spotify or Apple Music, where they can actually stream the full track. But it's very deliberate. You know, it's not, it's, there are plenty of examples of songs that suddenly get noticed kind of serendipitously on TikTok. You know, uh, Fleetwood Mac's Dreams re-emerging into the mainstream last year is a great example of that. That was not a planned marketing effort that just happened um, via a viral video. But often the labels are kind of paying creators to 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 try to get noticed on the app or the artists themselves also are on TikTok and you mentioned little Nas X um truly kind of one of the best at at using social media to get people to listen to his music and I think uh there's plenty of other examples of that even kind of up and coming artists that don't have even a record label at this point who can uh, use TikTok to to get a deal with a label or, you know, release a song on their own. So those are, I think, the main ways that that it kind of works. You talk to a number of industry executives who talk about how TikTok has changed the game and that it's not just about going viral on the app. There's also an impact on how a song charts on, say, Billboard, for example, or what it means long term. 
do you get a sense that understanding how TikTok works may also influence what the artists create or what songs record labels decide that they want to release. So it's no longer let me get this song on traditional radio, but it's also what are the things that could draw people in in TikTok? Is it affecting the content and creative process in that way? Yeah, so this is the question I have asked execs at labels. They say no. <laughs> they, they kind of deny that the uh, songwriting process is being influenced at all by things like social media. Um, but I think there are real examples of, of artists that are, are thinking about TikTok when they create. Uh, last year, I spoke to a, a Canadian music producer named Tiags, and he actually rose to, to prominence by making songs based on TikTok trends and memes. So kind of like grabbing a, a soundbite or snippet from a TikTok meme and kind of building a track around that. And he ended up landing a record label deal from that. So, I mean, I think that's one instance of it. But then you also see the labels kind of leaking snippets of songs before they actually release the actual album. And uh, so they're they're very aware that kind of the the discourse around a track or an artist on TikTok before you're kind of officially releasing a song can make a big impact. I will fully admit it won't be any surprise to our listeners. I absolutely love music. I, I love the way that music can make you feel, how music can connect to a memory or an experience, but also how music can spark discovery. And one of the ways that TikTok has been useful for me is that I will hear one of these snippets, a sound from some current artist, and I'm always thinking, wait, that sounds familiar. That sounds like a sample of something that I loved before. And one of those examples is um, You Are My High by DJ Snake, which became this viral sound. And I was listening to it thinking, wait, this sounds really familiar. And then I go back and realize it's actually a sample of Charlie Wilson and the Gap Band, a song of the same name. How is TikTok, that's sort of my experience, how is TikTok encouraging people or, you know, the connection of music, encouraging people to explore differently or to connect music in different ways? Yeah, so we've talked a bit about kind of the the labels and the artists that are using, trying to kind of infiltrate TikTok from the outside. But TikTok has its own robust global music division. And they are kind of pulling levers behind the scenes to help artists get discovered, whether that's kind of up, up and coming performers that, that, that are kind of building momentum on the app or working with the labels to promote kind of existing mainstream performers. So in, in the app, they can kind of promote songs via kind of like a carousel type ad unit. There's playlisting in TikTok, and that's, a, that's another way that uh, music gets discovered. They partner with artists to artists and labels to do kind of live stream performances as well. And then on, on the question of like discovering new genres, I think part of that just happens naturally. Um, I mean, I think the Fleetwood Mac example uh, is, is one that kind of illustrates that. But, you know, you also have kind of, when you mentioned kind of like sampling an older track, um, there was a big trend last year with uh, an adult swim as well, where kind of like this, this uh, producer sampled an older track and, and it went viral. So it's, it's, it's an interesting point. And I think that's one thing that is really unique about music on TikTok is it doesn't matter when the song was released. I think legacy tracks and songs that are kind of in the back catalog can resurface and get a new audience. And no one really cares if it's new or old. If it's catchy, they're going to go and listen to it on Spotify or Apple Music or wherever. One of the accounts that I've been following is of these two young men, they're teenagers, listening to quote unquote old music and seeing the reaction to hearing Phil Collins singing in the air tonight. And, you know, that drum section is iconic, but how they connect to it. But it also begs this question of who is benefiting from this relationship between TikTok and music? Is it giving artists and creatives a greater opportunity to get their music out there in ways that major record labels can no longer dictate? Or are the financial benefits of this still accruing to those traditional institutions that have long decided and shaped whose music we listen to? Yeah. So TikTok doesn't use 
doesn't get to use music for free. So the labels do set up kind of licensing deals and kind of like the big kind of holding companies have deals with TikTok to to get compensated every time the, their 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 songs are used. So I, I think like it's it's definitely a money making avenue. It's not just a promotional tool. There, there, there's ways that the labels benefit outside of just like uh, getting songs to go viral on TikTok. But I do think you know if you if you do if you talk to independent artists. I think they do feel empowered by the platform in the way that they probably feel empowered by things like YouTube and uh, Instagram as well. You know, we do focus a lot on TikTok because it's had such an outsized impact in recent months. But uh, I do think social media generally has taken on a bigger role, particularly in the past couple of years as live performances have shut down and we see more th- more kind of live stream con- uh, concerts happening on social media. So I do think it, it, it's unlikely to kind of like change the power dynamics in the music industry, but I do think it's creating new opportunities for undiscovered talent to uh, to get discovered quite simply. And you know, another example that I don't think it's talked about quite as much or it hasn't in a while is the Ratatouille musical that formed on TikTok, which we we don't often t- consider kind of like the this side of the industry or the business, but yeah, there was there were a group of kind of creators on TikTok that started kind of going back and forth and writing songs for a musical version of the Pixar film Ratatouille. Over time, it gained momentum. A kind of production company noticed it, and they ended up putting on this kind of celebrity laden performance of Ratatouille, the TikTok musical, for charity. And so I think that's a great example of kind of people that were never thinking that they would have the opportunity to get their talents discovered or or surfaced. And suddenly, you know, they have like a full fledged Broadway style performance uh, of their of their little TikTok video idea coming to fruition. There is so much creativity and innovation happening across this platform. And as we said at the beginning, TikTok is just five years old. And not only has become this sort of influential space, but it's really changing multiple industries in terms of how they approach that. What do you see as the future of this app when it comes to its relationship to music and culture and what it means to those of us who are music lovers and or consumers of this art form? Yeah, I think it will be interesting to see how the app continues to kind of control the conversation in a few years, hopefully when things have eased up a bit in terms of the global pandemic. Because I think like uh, social media in general has had a bigger role in the conversation. Everything from Twitch to YouTube to Instagram to TikTok, people are spending a lot more time in those types of platforms when they can't go to in-person events. And so will TikTok continue to be such a hub for listening to music when people can actually go to a concert hall or a live venue. I think we we have to wait and see. It's tough to predict. And I do think also that, uh, you know, you never know what's kind of lurking in the corner in terms of, of a new uh, platform that, that could end up becoming a, a useful tool for members of the music industry. And so I think it is really tough to predict. No one, no one really saw like TikTok emerging into what it was in in 2019 and 2020 there's probably another company waiting in the wings that has who <laughs> will become popular with creators so yeah i think we just kind of have to wait and see dan waitley is a media reporter for business insider he covers social media and the creator economy dan thank you so much for joining us thanks for having me to read Dan's reporting on TikTok and the music industry, you can check out the link on our webpage at ctpublic.org disrupted. This week's episode was produced by James Scoble-Wolf, Shekinah Collier, and Katie Talarski. Our interns are B. Levine and Dylan Reyes. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Thanks for listening. <laughs>